Welcome. You're watching Insights in Medicine on InTime TV, the world's only global internet TV talk show for professionals peer to peer. And uh, we have a great program ahead focusing on cerebral aneurysm disease. I'm Dr. Rogan Gorel, and our guest is Dr. Bernard Bendock. Uh, who is Assistant Professor of Neurological Surgery and Radiology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Education. He earned his uh, uh, degree, undergraduate degree, summa cum laude from Wayne State University in Detroit and his MD from Northwestern where he still is now of course in 1995 and uh, also did surgical internship at Northwestern and Neurological Surgery. What's also particularly uh, important in terms of our discussion of cerebral aneurysm disease is the fact that he also completed a neuroendovascular surgery fellowship. So in evolving areas like this that uh, span multiple specialties, Dr. Bendock is uniquely uh, situated, uniquely uh, qualified to talk about a rapidly evolving area, cerebral aneurysm disease, that has lots of implications for the general practitioner as well. So uh, welcome, Dr. Bendock. Thank you. Um, I hope I... I, I didn't do your background justice. Uh, Dr. Bendock sent me his CV uh, earlier in the week, and it's very th uh, thick <laughs> with lots of uh, speeches fine. and articles. So we clearly have important, you know, very exciting things to talk about. But the topic is advances in the management of uh, cere cerebral aneurysm disease. So why don't you s start out and just summarize for us the epidemiology uh, of cerebral aneurysm sure, disease, uh, etiology, and sort of the background. Uh, cerebral aneurysms is a very interesting uh, disease. It's one of the important causes of hemorrhagic stroke. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as you know, stroke is the number one cause of disability in the United States. Mm. And aneurysm disease tends to affect people at a younger age than ischemic disease. So there's a particularly uh, strong impact on public health. Now the numbers are also interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that about 6% of the population has an aneurysm. Most people don't even know it. Six percent. About six percent. And when you say younger population, my understanding is, but correct me, uh, it's like the the classic forty-year-old, you know, middle-aged woman. Uh, uh, correct. Uh, it, you know, aneurysm disease tends to hit uh, between uh, the ages of forty and sixty. Although uh, younger people can uh, have an aneurysm, and certainly older people can too. But on average, hemorrhagic stroke in general tends to affect people at a younger age than ischemic stroke, which tends to occur more in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, whereas hemorrhagic stroke occurs at younger decades. So in terms of an impact on you know, public health, uh, there is a, an important issue there. And when you would say impact on, you know, people have many years alive, they have uh, active families, and Correct. it's really, exactly. obviously every life is a critical situation, but these can be very tragic. Correct. You know, uh, we think that about 30,000 Americans rupture an aneurysm each year, uh, uh, and when aneurysm rupture occurs, there's about a 10% chance of dying instantaneously and not yes. making it to the hospital. And of people who do make it to the hospital, only about half or so have a good outcome. Right. The other half have stroke or death. So the outcome, while it has improved over the last century, uh, progress is still ne ne needs to be made before we get better outcomes. And you said a very interesting comment. Uh, we think 30,000 people have a ruptured aneurysm. Are there not central registries? Is there or a uh, overarching organization that tracks? Sure, we, you know, we, uh, as you know, um, as you may know, uh, tracking some of these can be difficult. For example, a person who drops suddenly and dies, if an autopsy isn't, a careful autopsy isn't done, in the old days people would just say that, oh, that must have been a heart attack. Yes, right. And some of those may have been aneurysm rupture. Uh, the best data we have is about 30,000, but uh, these things are not as carefully tracked as one would think, of course, and yeah. and and, uh, and the numbers could be higher. Right. I mean, that's one of the things uh, I want to develop during the program is sort of the connection between the neurosurgeons, the the neuro team, if you will, at the tertiary centers where these often obviously have to be taken care of, and the primary physicians out in the field. Sure. Both from obviously patient care perspective, but also even public health. It. it a lot of the teachings are not brought back, so I, I hope in this program we can address some of those uh, Absolutely. Issues. I think that's very important because it is a team effort. Right. Uh, we often rely and depend on the proper diagnoses being made at the, by the primary care physicians, the emergency room physicians, uh, 
In, in fact, about 20 to 50 percent of aneurysm ruptures are preceded by warning symptoms mm -hmm. that can often be overlooked if uh, one is not paying attention to the subtleties sure. of the uh, history and exam and so on. Well, we'll get to some of those warning signs and signs and symptoms. I think it would be really critical so, uh, for our uh, general practitioner audience and just in general, even the lay public. But before we get that, what is the current scientific understanding of aneurysm disease and its etiology? And, and just describe a little bit about that. Well, it, it is my area of research interest, yeah. uh, so uh, I'll try not to bore you with too much detail. But it is a very... We'll invite you for another session <laughs> for the for the details. Uh, but it is a very interesting area. We, our knowledge about aneurysm disease biology for, and, yeah. and, and the behavior of aneurysms is not perfect. Uh, we know a couple things though. We know that brain vessels are just made different than other body vessels. Hmm. Uh, body vessels have two elastic lamina, which are the strength layer of the vessel, whereas brain vessels only have one elastic lamina layer. Why? No one really knows. The brain, which accounts for about 5% of the body mass, uh, absorb or consumes 20% of the cardiac output. So those vessels are under probably more stress than body vessels. And uh, has that actually been verified? I mean, are, are there yeah. ways to mechanically measure this to uh, the extent sure. that there's a greater stress per volume uh, ratio? It has been. We know that b brain vessels, there's um, a significant amount of literature, uh, studies have been done in the biomechanical arena, yeah, exactly. hemodynamic arena, showing that uh, brain vessels, uh, because of the th thinner walls, and because uh, brain vessels divide sharply as they c come into the head, mm. uh, uh, brain vessels take right angles. Uh, it's more uh, turbulent flow. They're potentially more turbulent flow. And in fact, most brain vessels form in the direction blood would have gone had there not been a bifurcation. So most brain, ve uh, brain aneurysms form at, at bifurcation points. Or, or at the bifurcation point which didn't bifurcate. Uh, uh, or yes, it's the point, yes. uh, maybe we can demonstrate, or you can. Sure. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, at the areas where the vessels bifurcate or divide, you can imagine that blood really for 30, 40 would years straight. would want to go straight, but is being, the blood is being forced in a different direction. So that creates an a, uh, area of turbulence, an area of sheer stress mm -hmm. that, uh, in our sense is that the body is actually trying to heal micro-injury, and most of the time, the body does that very well, but occasionally uh, the body doesn't do it so perfectly and an aneurysm starts to form. Mm -hmm. And uh, that leads to a cascade of things, which eventually probably, um, we think that an inflammatory response occurs. We don't understand it perfectly yet, but we think some type of uh, inflammatory response leads to uh, a process that results in the, ve the vessel being broken down further and the wall being broken down further right. until rupture occurs. So to some extent, I was just about to say that uh, the uh, AAA abdominal aortic aneurysm, atherosclerotic related aneurysms are a different etiology, uh, a different uh, kettle of fish, if you will. I sure. apologize for that. But to some extent, to the extent that there's inflammation involved in both, there yes. is a relationship. We're coming up on a break. Let's explore that briefly right after the break. I'm Dr. Ogan Gurel. We're here with Dr. Bernard Bendock uh, of the Department of Neurological Surgery and Radiology at Northwestern discussing cerebral aneurysm disease. We'll be right back. Stay right there. Ah, I'm a lion! <laughs> yes, you are. Come here. Let's see how this looks. Hey! hey. How's my little horse? She's a lion. Yes, she is. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. When you adopt a child from foster care, just being there makes all the difference. Come on! This way! Who's that guy? I don't know! Sorry, I'll be my mind! I know, I know! Four score and seven years ago. Think history is a little scary? Then log on to LOC.gov and see how much fun it can be. The Library of Congress at LOC.gov. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Ogan Gurel. You're watching Insights in Medicine on InTime TV. 
and we have as our guest Dr. Bernard Bendock, professor, uh, assistant professor, associate professor, assistant professor, assistant professor but rapidly, uh, obviously, moving in his career uh, of neurosurgery as well as radiology at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine, an expert in cerebral aneurysm disease. Just before we, the break, we were talking about the scientific basis, the biology of aneurysm formation, an area of specifically his uh, research interests, complementing his clinical work. Tell us a little bit more. Well, one interesting fact is, other than humans, the only species that we know of that has aneurysms is the Galapagos turtle, because they live for, for a very long time. Oh, yeah, 300 years or something. Yeah, and uh, so aneurysm disease was not a problem for the human species up until the last 100 years, because people didn't live long enough. And we occasionally see aneurysms in pediatric uh, population and, and people teens, but really it's only later in life. So elephants, who also live long, do not get aneurysm disease? Not that we know of. Right. Uh, I'm not sure to what degree people have done careful autopsies, but the only species that has been carefully documented is the Galapagos turtle. Interesting. Well, that's interesting because people talk about the human species and the brain obviously being very different in terms of the evolution and so forth. And the ability to compress a lot of gray matter in the head, if you will, yeah. was part of the ge genetic switch that uh, enabled that shift into the human species. Right. Is the fact that the blood vessels are thinner in this regard with two, uh, one elastic l lamina instead of two, does it actually reduce, in the sense, the non-brain matter, the non-gray matter? Uh, that's certainly intriguing. I'd never thought of it that way, but uh, it's certainly an inter interesting hypothesis. But uh, that hasn't really been explored. Not, not well explored, no. Not a lot of clinical application, so we'll right. leave that for another time. Okay. But in terms of a clinical application, you had mentioned uh, in passing the warning signs, and I definitely want to get to that. Uh, a lot of our audience is primary care physicians, general practitioners, and obviously other interested specialists. Tell us a little bit about the symptoms, the warning signs, and then I mean, and the signs. Right. You know, one of the challenges with uh, diagnosing a brain aneurysm, a symptomatic brain aneurysm, is that headaches are so common. Uh, of course. And uh, in that sea of, of headaches that ER physicians are encounter, uh, there are a couple uh, patients, or a small fraction of patients, who will, will have aneurysm disease, but it's an important subgroup Obviously, because of the yeah. outcome is so potentially so, uh, can be so bad if, if the diagnosis isn't made. Uh, and uh, the key, the, but there are key things about the history that stand out or should stand out. Sure to differentiate a, a migraine headache, for example, from a, or a common headache or a stress headache from a uh, aneurysm, aneurysm related headache. And one of the key things that one should look for is a thunderclap headache, or patients typically describe, doctor, this was the worst headache of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I, when thunderclap implies sudden onset. It's a sudden onset right. uh, headache, whereas most other headaches, and again, this isn't foolproof, but it's certainly, it's relatively sensitive, when patients say my headache started out of the blue, it was like an explosion, uh, you've got to look for an aneurysm. That's a key tip-off. Key, key tip-off. When they tell you that my headache started gradually over time, uh, it's often or most of the time it's not a serious type of headache, although it's not 100%. But th when people say they had a sudden severe headache, I think one has to assume that it's an aneurysm or some type of rupture or bleed until proven otherwise. Some uh, aneurysms, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, can, can cause a sort of a chronic pain situation. For example, with ophthalmic artery aneurysms on the eye and sure. so forth. So there is an element of pain, but the actual rupture has that thunderclap quality. Correct. And you bring up a good point. Uh, not every headache that is caused by an aneurysm necessarily implies rupture. Uh, we've, see, we've seen, uh, we think, we, th this is sort of hard to prove, but... Uh, headaches that are aneurysms that are growing could potentially uh, cause headaches, or aneurysms that are stretching the dura, aneurysms that are exactly. in the cavernous sinus. What you're right. alluding yeah. to. So there is another subgroup of. Uh, so it, it, there can be nuances that have to be worked through. Um, uh, we've seen some aneurysms that have ruptured just locally. So even a lumbar puncture would not necessarily pick up that subgroup. So I think the clinical uh, suspicion remains a very important uh, part of the evaluation of the patient. Right. Um, and then, uh, to what extent are meningeal signs neck stiffness? Uh, is that more an urban legend, or is that uh, really something 
certainly any patient with a sudden severe headache and meningeal signs. That's pretty... Uh, that is very suggestive, sure. And uh, the absence of meningeal signs is not enough to rule out an aneurysm, but the, the presence is certainly uh, one that in my mind and most people's minds ought to prompt a more thorough investigation into the possibility of an aneurysm. I, I think that's important to keep in mind. I mean, a lot of people obviously associate subarachnoid hemorrhage with blood in the CSF and hence meningeal signs. Uh, ironically, and you can comment on this, if you have a sudden headache and no meningeal signs, that could even be more ominous to the extent that the, the CSF flow locally is, is disturbed or blocked. Uh, potentially, you can imagine a situation where an aneurysm ruptures and causes a hematoma in the brain. Exactly. Where you may not have meningeal signs, and I think that's what you're alluding to, and that could be even more dangerous exactly. than uh, a mild subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I think the uh, a thunderclap headache is, is, is a key uh, sign or symptom. Anything else? There are other things that one can look for. Uh, cranial neuropathies. Mm. There are certain types of aneurysms that will press on certain cranial nerves. For example, a posterior communicating artery aneurysm can cause a third nerve palsy. And a third nerve palsy, dilation of the pupil, uh, third nerve palsy with... Unilateral. Unilateral. Right. Uh, third nerve palsy... Uh, should su suggest the possibility of an aneurysm unless it's pupillary sparing, in which case it could also be a diabetic neuropathy. Yes. Um, um, anything about the, obviously, a rushed ER physician or a uh, you know, rushed primary care doctor or, or any physician for that matter presented with these clinical signs, you obviously doing the whole complicated neuro exam. What are some of the bread and butter uh, things one should do from a neuro neurological exam perspective? Yeah, from a neurological exam, I think the, the most important things are to check for meningismus, mm -hmm. uh, to check the pupillary reaction, to make sure the pupils are equal and reactive, to make sure that extraocular mo mo movement is normal, um, that the motor exam is symmetric. Mm -hmm. uh, one probably doesn't need to get into the fine detail Babinski of the sensory exam. Babinski reflex. Although Babinski can be important, but certainly, uh, obviously all these things require clinical judgment, but the cranial nerve exam, meningismus, and a motor exam are probably the most important things. Right. And the mental status. Of course, yeah, uh, from, the, from the outset. Right. Um, we're heading into a break. We're talking about cerebral aneurysm disease with Dr. Bernard Bendock, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery, Radiology at Northwestern University. Be right back. Once they've outgrown their toddler seat, they're still not ready for adult safety belts alone. Four foot nine is the magic number. Until then, kids need a booster seat. Make sure your little pumpkin gets there safely. Visit BoosterSeat.gov. from mannequinism. Volunteer. Vote. Stay informed. It's easy to get involved. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Rogan Gorel with In Time TV's Insights in Medicine. Our uh, distinguished guest is Dr. Bernard Bendock of the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. We're having a very important discussion about cerebral aneurysm disease. We started in the beginning about the epidemiology. It affects about 30,000 uh, individuals. We don't quite know the number because about 10% of that is estimated basically never to reach the hospital and die on the spot. And uh, to some extent, they don't get an autopsy. We don't know. And that highlights, that statistic alone highlights the seriousness of this condition. We're talking about uh, for the primary care doctor or the ER physician or a specialist that comes across this thunderclap headache certainly being a critical key symptom that we should raise suspicion. Uh, meningismus is obviously, uh, meningeal signs are obviously very important, but the lack thereof is, is not ruled out. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about risk factors that for uh, aneurysm disease and associated conditions with right. aneurysm disease. Uh, epidemiological studies have shown that smoking is probably the biggest one. Mm. Uh, smoking is bad news. The hypothesis is that the elastase, which is in, in cigarettes, gets absorbed in the blood and that results in degradation of the vessel wall beyond what the hemodynamics does. So the same process of elastase affecting uh, the, the lung elastin and emphysema? Correct. Right. And so it's, uh, I jokingly tell some of my patients that who have had an aneurysm not to smoke because uh, smoking is like a fertilizer for aneurysms and right, it can right. make them grow and rupture. So it's, if, there's w if there's one thing you can tell a patient to do who has an aneurysm if they don't want to treat it or even if they do treat it is to stop smoking. Other things that have been looked at are hypertension, mm -hmm. uh, smoking, particularly binge, I'm sorry, uh, drinking, particularly uh, binge drinking. Uh, we think there may be a hormonal impact of drinking that can influence aneurysm disease. Interestingly, women get aneurysms more than men, although after menopause, uh, the numbers equalize. There, we think that there is a hormonal uh, factor there. The older versions of birth control pills uh, seem to have an impact on aneurysm disease. The newer, lower doses uh, we're not as convinced are having an impact on aneurysm disease. You had mentioned about the, the histological aspects of the cerebral arteries being different. Right. Uh, are, are the arteries between females and males different in that regard? That's a great question and actually that's one thing that I am researching and uh, we think that, we know for example that uh, prior to menopause men do get, a seem to get atherosclerosis uh, more than women. We know that vascular diseases present with different numbers yeah, exactly. in men and women. So we think that uh, uh, there is, pr but interestingly a lot of these things tend to uh, become equal after menopause. So that um, at least in aneurysm disease uh, it seems that there's uh, the estrogen and other hormones seem to modulate the vessel's response to stress exactly. in a different way. So there, is diff there are differences. I don't think we fully understand them, but there are differences. Well, it's interesting. On, on this show, we had Annabelle Volgman, director of the Rush Heart uh, Women's Heart Center, speak about the differences in coronary artery disease between right. women and men. And clearly, that's manifesting itself also in cerebral aneurysm disease. Correct. Um, but it's not overwhelming. I mean, it's maybe 60, 40 women uh, to men or that's, something that's like true. that. That's true. It is not a, a major, interesting, but not certainly not a major difference. Right. So uh, other risk factors for aneurysm disease? Uh, there are associated conditions. Or associated which, conditions. Uh, well, one issue is the issue of uh, family history. Mm. And uh, people in the general population, we think that aneurysms, like I said before, occur uh, in about 6% of the population. If there are two family members, first degree family members with an aneurysm, the chance of finding another aneurysm in that family or the chance of a family member having an aneurysm is about 30%. So the number, numbers go up significantly. Um, are there specific uh, conditions, I mean probably rare, that, that are just almost the dominant or, or very uh, highly penetrating in terms of aneurysm disease like uh, familial polypo polyposis for colon cancer right. and so forth? Polycystic kidney disease is one and we think that, the, uh, that there's a protein that's uh, defective in that disease that makes blood vessels of the brain uh, more susceptible to aneurysms. And we think that people with polycystic kidney disease may have a rate of aneurysmal disease as high as 30%. Right. So um, that certainly is one. Other rarer diseases uh, are things like Marfan's disease, other connective tissue disease like Ehlers-Danlos. Um, Perhaps the most important one, though, is polycystic kidney disease because those patients are living long enough exactly. where the disease can manifest. Right. And there's, uh, in terms of, this is a topic that we've discussed a lot on this program, personalized medicine in many different guises or manifestations. Um, one of the, the holy grails of personalized medicine is we have percentages. We'd like to convert that into a deterministic outcome, if you will, for sure. individuals. And aneurysm disease has always struck me as very, like, run the odds sort of thing. And as we said at the outset, 6% of the population has aneurysm disease. Clearly not all of them are manifesting or even rupturing. Uh, are, are there things on the horizon that we could somehow start to make it less of a dice roll and more of a deterministic uh, In terms of program. diagnosing the disease? Diagnosing and, screening and, and then screening. We're moving right, that, into that, that, that's just uh, from a high level. Let's think about right, that. Right. The NIH, uh, we were involved in the, study, the uh, familial intracranial aneurysm study funded by the NIH mm -hmm. looking at that issue. Right now people are focusing on the familial cases to learn more about the genetics and hopefully those lessons 
may potentially apply to the general population. People are looking aggressively for a marker, a, a blood test. Uh, unfortunately, the current screening modality is MRA, which is quite expensive. Uh, and so it would be ideal to have a blood test. Exactly. And, uh, or a screen at birth that determines the odds of having an aneurysm so that we could screen more intelligently. Right now, the only intelligent thing we have to go by are these rare associated conditions or a strong family history. And are there animal models of aneurysm disease? There are some interesting animal models. Most aneurysm animal models do not replicate the human condition well enough. Just because of almost the physics, the size. Correct. I mean, you know, if you do a, a mouse model, it's just very different. It's very different uh, physiology, yeah. exactly. And so people have done vein graft models, but they are more suitable to mechanical studies of devices right. rather than to biology. Um, but there are some mouse models that are, again, have some genetic, interesting, uh, uh, potentially genetic um, issues that could potentially help us understand the biology better. But again, like you said, the the relationship to the human condition is quite uh, is, is not quite there right. in, uh, in my mind. Well, I see an interesting uh, parallel with the familial intracranial aneurysms and how we made the cholesterol link. Um, I, I forget, I apologize, the actual name of the disease, but there's a very a rare disease that people have sky-high cholesterol levels. They were right. dying of heart attacks uh, very early on. Brown and Goldstein of University of Texas and all that right. kind of work, and hopefully that will be analogous for aneurysm. Yes, yes. Well, we're uh, on a break. Uh, coming up shortly, we're talking with Dr. Bernard Bundock of the Feinberg School of Medicine Northwestern, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery and Radiology. We're discussing cerebral aneurysm disease, a lot more important considerations coming right up. Two words for you. Pop quiz. Ready? Name any funny movie, a drama. Name a mystery. And one more thing. Name the movie your kids saw today in science class. Know what really matters. Know about your kid's school and know about your kid. Find out 100 ways to know more, do more. There's something about you, baby. There's something about you, baby. I can't get enough. There's something about you, baby. I got you looking at me. I'm gonna call you bluff. There's something about you. something about you. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. It takes a man to be a dad. I'm at soccer practice. What if something happens? Will you come get me? There's no reason not to have a plan in case of an emergency. Should we go to the neighbor's house? And some extremely good reasons why you should. Can you tell me? Talk to your family about what you would do in case of an emergency. Dr. Ogan Garel, you're watching Insights in Medicine. The topic is the management of cerebral aneurysm disease update. Our uh, distinguished guest and expert is Dr. Bernard Bendock of Northwestern University School of Medicine, uh, Neurosurgery and Radiology. And uh, we're going to get to some of those fancy techniques and new uh, advances, but we're on the topic which is very important on screening. Uh, is there screening? Uh, it's a rhetorical question, of course, and when should screening be considered? You know, it's, uh, screening is an interesting area, and I think it is part of, a big part of the future of medicine. Yeah, of course. Like you said, and to figure out, uh, because when an aneurysm ruptures, uh, the outcomes are not very good in the majority of patients. Uh, 
So if we could treat aneurysms before they rupture and select patients, I think we could make a, improve outcomes. And, and just uh, for those who are maybe coming in later, 10% die at the instant of the rupture. At least 10%. It could be higher. And then 50% don't make it to the hospital, or 50% make it to the hospital or but die. Of the ones who make it to the hospital, about half have a good outcome and half outcome, exactly. stroke or death. Those are pretty grim numbers. Um, and uh, currently the, the recommendations that we, we follow for, or the guidelines we follow at our institution, and there is some controversy in this area, uh, we screen any family that has two first-degree relatives with an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. Where we sometimes run into a question is if it's a second-degree relative, we just don't have enough data to know for sure. The, m the most important families to screen, in my mind, are the ones where there are fir two first-degree relatives. Okay. And uh, we, we do MRA at time zero, at time of diagnosis, and every five years thereafter. It's very important to... Time of diagnosis or time of... Or time of... Uh, screening. Time of screening, yeah, correct. Right. And uh, bec we do it every five years because uh, we've, we've learned recently that, uh, that aneurysms are a dynamic disease and that uh, just because you don't have a, an aneurysm at time zero, at time of screening, doesn't mean you won't have one in five years. Sure. And uh, so that's, that's how we do it. Now, I mean, obviously there are age considerations to the extent that if this is a first degree level, but they're five years old, you're not going to do the screening. That's an, I get that question a, a lot. What and, is the and, age that we start that we, process? Because aneurysm, interestingly, familial aneurysms tend to rupture a decade younger than the sporadic aneurysms. You can't wait till 40. Right. So I typically have done it in the 20s. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, there actually is no, there are no guidelines yes. on that question uh, unless the child has headaches. And, and one That's could right. say that any child with a headache should get an MRI anyway. Right. Or MRI, MRA, where you run a child. Obviously, it's very difficult to do that in a, in a three-year-old. But uh, certainly any child who complains of a headache should have brain imaging. And uh, MRI, MRA is, in my mind, the way to go. Now, are we talking about just garden variety headaches or thunderclap headache? Well, uh, in general, and this is getting into pediatric neurology, yeah, which is right, in my right. area, but uh, any child who has a headache that can't be explained of course. You know, by uh, an exam the next day or or a uh, little too much homework, right. uh, probably should, should be seen by a pediatric neurologist or a pediatric primary care physician. And that may very well lead to an MRI. Could, could lead to an yeah, MRI. And then certainly and the thunderclap variety. Uh, that one is for sure. And certainly if a parent has an aneurysm, especially if the parent had it at a young age, we see okay. people now, if they, so um, those are issues that could, you know, if one is on the fence about an MRI, a family history of an aneurysm may t tilt one to do the MRI. Well, this is all very interesting because to the extent that the, obviously aneurysm disease is a very important but rarefied disease to the extent that neurosurgeons are really dealing with it. But out in the front lines with family practitioners, uh, and general practitioners, and knowing the whole family, and, and many people may not make that connection. So it's very important to right. bring those patients into the fold. You know, the, the more you ask, the more you'll find. Family history is one of the, at least for neurosurgeons, uh, most neurosurgeons 20 years ago probably didn't ask a lot about family history. And we're doing that more often now, and it's surprising how many people we're finding who do have family history of diseases. Or often they'll tell you, well, my aunt died suddenly, but we never knew why. Mm. And so it raises a question as to whether we, we probably should be asking that question more often. What else is in your family? Because uh, it could lead into insights that we didn't have uh, before. Well, obviously screening raises the question of prophylactic treatment. Correct. What's the, uh, uh, well, let's put it more broadly, what's the management if you do find an aneurysm? Right. We, we've learned our knowledge regarding what aneurysms will do once you find them is not perfect. Mm. And, but we do have some good studies. And in the last five years, uh, a very large study, the ISUIA, International Study of Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms, which is an ongoing study actually, uh, has, uh, has put out some data on this issue. And we know that aneurysms are more dangerous if they're larger and if they are in certain locations of the brain. So we know that size and location do matter. Mm -hmm. A larger aneurysm in general will have a higher risk of rupture than a smaller aneurysm. Aneurysms in the cavernous sinus, for example, that are small are very benign in general. Mm -hmm. uh, even a small aneurysm in the in the basilar artery, for example, is a problem. can be a problem. Uh, certainly age also plays into the issue whether one should treat or not. A 10 millimeter aneurysm on the basilar artery in a 40 year old is one issue versus that same aneurysm in a 85 year old. 
And is age because of the operative or procedural risk, or is it because of the brain size and, and room to expand? Really, really both. Or the, the, we or know the, that uh, yeah. procedural risk, particularly on the open surgical side, does go up above the age of 65. And uh, on the endovascular side, actually, the rates are fairly flat. Yes. Um, but the other issue is, uh, and the way I look at it is longevity, that if we know that, uh, that an aneurysm has, a, let's say, a 1% risk of rupture per year, if the, person, if the patient has terminal cancer and only has one year to live, I would look at that one way versus somebody who's 35 and has 50 years to live. The, yes. the, the risk to the patient uh, is much different. And, the, and as we look at the risk-benefit ratio, age and the size and location of the aneurysm t play into that analysis. Unfortunately, there's no computer program that will give you a yes or no answer whether to treat an aneurysm, but those are all the factors that we take right. into account. Well, it's fascinating because uh, uh, I I've written about this and studied it, the, the whole concept of the evidence-based medicine. Obviously, a lot of people are looking to that right. as a, a great way to literally, obviously, guide practice. Right. But it's, it's fascinating because often those come with very fairly static recommendations. But Correct. to the extent that something unfolds over time and you have to, in a calculus sense, integrate the risk over time, we don't have, as you say, any computer programs. You know, what's really fascinating to me is that our best study on natural history of aneurysm disease gives you five-year data, but aneurysm disease is a disease that affects one for their whole life. Exactly. So, you, so it's, we, it's impossible to really you know, do... It's one thing when you study pneumonia, which, let's say, has a two-, three-week course. Exactly. Whereas you, if you study a disease that can affect you your whole life, it is very hard to enroll human beings into studies for 40 years. That's, most people want to publish before you know before that time <laughs> yes, right. and and so it, it's hard to do that right that's a big challenge and I think uh, aneurysm disease it, I mean obviously is very important but it's not the only of these chronic diseases that right. to some extent we're applying the evidence-based framework that's quite applicable to acute disorders acute conditions to the chronic case and it's not necessarily the same story that's, uh, that's true from an analytical statistical s scientific approach that's true uh, well, let's get into the practical side. Uh, we're coming up on a break, but let's give it some thought. Prophylactic treatment. I mean, to the extent that you actually want to do something because of the concerns that you mentioned on the screening, let's say it's too large, the age, and so forth. Correct. So we're coming up to a break. Uh, be right back. We're going to talk about prophylactic treatment of cerebral aneurysm disease. I'm Dr. Ogan Gurel. We have Dr. Bernard Bendock of Northwestern uh, Neurosurgery with us. Stay right there. Look forward to discussing this further. if you've had way too many but what if you've had just one too many buzz driving is drunk driving hey guys thanks for coming are we in trouble no you're not in trouble i just uh, want to set some ground rules like, like what well remember last week when you hit Vinny in the head with the shovel <laughs> i do not recall that of course not. Well, it was pretty graphic. Too graphic for the kids. <laughs> so I'm going to have to block you. I, you know, i got to make this up to you. This is Vinny's watch, and I want you to have it. You deserve no, it. Thank you. That's really not necessary. No, no. Come here. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Rogan Garel. This is Insights in Medicine. We have Dr. Bernard Bendock of Northwestern Neurosurgery, and we're discussing cerebral aneurysm disease. We're just going to quickly talk about prophylactic treatment and then move into actual rupture and uh, the treatment thereof and, and the, the broader aspects of care of the patient. So prophylactic treatment, briefly, what, what is out there once someone's crossed the threshold? Right. And... Uh, the discussion often will depend on what we understand of the natural history. And as I said before, the natural history studies are not perfect, but we try to incorporate 
as much as we can from all these studies into our discussion with patients. And so whether to treat an aneurysm or not depends on the natural history risk balanced against the treatment risk. Yeah, of course. And both will depend on a number of factors. The natural history risk, again, will depend on the size of the aneurysm, the location, the neck size, whether there's calcium in the neck, for example, mm -hmm. um, the age of the patient, comorbidities, which could impact uh, anesthetic concerns. Uh, and then the risk of treatment will also depend on the location of the aneurysm, how it projects, for example, the size, um, anatomic features, which, are, uh, which we study very carefully. And so, uh, again, there's no computer program to say whether an aneurysm should be treated prophylactically or not, mm -hmm. but we take all those factors into consideration when recommending or treatment or not recommending treatment. Yeah, of course. And there are some times where things are black and white, and there are times where whether to treat or not is a real uh, tough decision. And I would imagine, and this is just a, a quick guess, that prophylactic treatment is often more on the endovascular side than an open craniotomy. Uh, it depends on, um, it depends, because endovascular treatment, while less invasive, does carry recurrence risk. Mm. So for a younger patient with a very easily accessible aneurysm... Craniotomy-wise. Uh, Craniotomy-wise, yeah. correct. Uh, one would I got yeah. maybe lean towards surgery, whereas, let's say, an older patient with a difficult-to-access aneurysm, surgically, would lean towards probably more of an endovascular approach. So that's interesting because then statistically speaking, as you're weighing all the, the risks and benefits, one would think that younger patients would get prophylactic treatment more, and to the extent that they tolerate craniotomy more, you would, in a way, get more craniotomies prophylactic. Potentially, and that, that area is controversial. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been a fascinating hour, going very quickly. I want to get to patient presents with rupture, thunderclap headache, you're the ER doc, and you have a very strong suspicion of subarachnoid hemorrhage, aneurysm rupture, what do you do? I think at that point, I think it's very important to get a CAT scan of the brain very quickly mm -hmm. because CAT scan... In this is a non-contrast no, CT. Non, yes, a non-contrast CT. In over 95% of cases, the diagnosis can be made with a CAT scan. It's a, it has about... A, most CT scanners have about a 95 to even up to 99% sensitivity for subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it's important to keep in mind that number isn't 100%. So a negative, a high clinical suspicion with a negative CAT scan doesn't mean the patient gets to go home. Yeah. The other very important issue I think that is uh, worth a minute to talk about is the, issue, is the issue of controlling blood pressure. Oftentimes when people have ruptured an aneurysm, blood pressure can be high because people are anxious, they're in the mm -hmm. ER. Somebody's been whispering in the hallway that there may be an aneurysm. Yes. And when people hear that word, to most people who have aneurysms. And they're in pain too. And they're in pain from the aneurysm yeah, yeah. rupture. Uh, pressure is high. And one of the biggest risk factors in my mind for a re-bleed, another hemorrhage, is, is high blood pressure. Um, and another hemorrhage will, could mean uh, death or stroke of in course. about 50% of cases. So it's very important to, uh, to uh, keep the pressure under control. And the best way to do that in my mind is with an A-line and antihypertensives. At one point to do that obviously will vary on, uh, on the clinical situation it's important, too, that when one does that, that one doesn't induce pain. Uh, right, so right. placing an alien has to be done very carefully with sedation and local anesthetic, et cetera. Uh, and so let's say the CT was done and the CT was negative, but the clinical suspicion is high. The next step is usually a lumbar puncture. And it's important that the lumbar puncture be done with a small needle and, and that it be done in a, in a, using a very specified protocol, which involves four tubes. So uh, we typically recommend that only three cc's be taken off. Yes. Uh, ideally, we love when an experienced person does it because the worst kind of LP is done by someone, let's say their first time doing it, and they get a lot of bleeding, and then we have a hard time distinguishing between aneurysm bleeding and trauma. I mean, do you think that uh, if you have high clinical suspicion, a grossly uh, positive CT, I mean, would you send someone to a tertiary center without the LP? I, in that situation, I would not do an LP. Exactly, right, yeah. So, so in fact, L, what's the, the context The lumbar of the LP? puncture is really for those situations where the CAT scan is negative. But oh, so in a sense, the LP is really not part of the workup in the, in the op most obvious cases, clearly. Although it, it is done f a fair amount of times because you do get, uh, you know, other types of headaches which can mimic subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
mm. uh, vascular migraines in, in some cases can mimic a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, an orgasmic headache uh, mm -hmm. is also another, uh, uh, or what we call orgasmic cephalgia, mm -hmm. uh, can be a, a problematic issue in the ER. So the CAT scan is negative. What do you do then? Do you send them home? So uh, you really do need to rule it out in that sense. You do need to rule it out. And that's a very important point. Some people more recently suggested just doing a CT angiogram, but that's not universally available. And one has to wonder whether it's, it doesn't have 100% sensitivity for the diagnosis. So a lumbar puncture is important in that situation. There is another situation where lumbar puncture should not, in my mind, should not be done. And that one of those situations is the one you mentioned where the CT is positive for blood, right. then it's not necessary. The other situation is w if the CT angiogram was done and the patient has a good history and there is an aneurysm, uh, lumbar puncture could, could create uh, a rupture right. by uh, creating a drop in the transmural pressure or increasing the transmural pressure. That, uh, so in, in some cases, the lumbar puncture should not be done. So in a sense, the, the CSF around it that is tamponading... Could be stabilizing the aneurysm. Stabilizing, tamponading, however you want to call it. So it could be quite dangerous. And I think that's a critical point. I think the, the concept is if you... I mean, to, to summarize, if you rule in an aneurysm, in a sense, that's off to the tertiary center, no LP. Uh, I, I agree with that, yes. And if there, you need to rule out an aneurysm, it's a very careful LP. Very careful LP, with correct. With three cc's and the four tubes. Correct. Um, well, th this is very important. One of the other things we want to talk about, which is critical, last week we had Dr. Peter Wyden, uh, director of the psychosis program at the University of Illinois, talking about the importance of communication between the primary care doctors and the psychiatrists. I think it's very important also the communication in that emergent situation between the primary care doctors, the ER doctors, the frontline docs, and the neurosurgery and neurological team. We're going to talk a little bit about that, basically how to communicate the information in the most effective way possible for the patient's benefit. This is Insights in Medicine with Dr. Ogan Gorel, Dr. Bernard Bendock of Northwestern. We'll be right back. can provide the support you need to reduce your risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Eat right and get active. Impossible. It's never too early to start reading to your kids. Are you prepared for what awaits you? There are amazing possibilities when you open a child's mind to reading. Log on to the Library of Congress website and let the journey begin. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Ogan Gorel with Insights in Medicine. Our guest, Dr. Bernard Bendock of Northwestern. We're talking about cerebral aneurysm disease. Just before uh, the break, we were talking about the diagnosis of the disease, obviously clinical suspicion, thunderclap headache, and so forth. The absolute importance of getting a non-contrast CT as soon as possible in that clinical setting. And um, very importantly, also, if that's ruled in on the basis of CT, basically to the tertiary center. And we'll go talk quickly about the communication. And then in terms of ruling out, to do an LP to make sure, but a very careful one and so forth. So you got the patient who you know, has an aneurysm, very serious situation, and you have the neurosurgeon on the phone. What needs to transpire? How can you optimize that patient for getting there? Well, I think some sense of the clinical exam is helpful because, uh, and because if someone is drifting into a coma or let's say someone is becoming hydrocephalic, you know, unfortunately, some hospitals now are not covered by neurosurgeons. Yeah, right. And so I... It's an increasing problem, actually. Right. And uh, so I think that is an important issue because if, especially if it's going to be a long transport time, if a patient is drift, if a patient is wide awake and alert, that's one issue versus a patient who's becoming very lethargic. Mm -hmm. That could imply rise in brain pressure yes. that may need to be dealt with uh, more expeditiously. 
So sometimes determining the route of transfer can be can be important. Exactly. Um, and, and sometimes um, s seeing or at least getting a very good description of the imaging can be very helpful. For example, if there's a blood clot in addition to the aneurysm, that could be a surgical emergency. You need a craniotomy team. Very quickly available. A, a, almost like a trauma team and right. not just the... And 20% yeah. of aneurysm bleeds can be associated with a hematoma. And I forgot to mention one of the other summary points that we established was importance of blood pressure control. Uh, with an A line and obviously done carefully, and so you want to communicate the blood pressure and, and absolutely and, and, those elements. Uh, and I usually prefer to pay for a patient to have a blood pressure drip. That's not always feasible, right? But to have b tight blood pressure control during transfer. One thing I, I think that's important to point out is that uh, when examining a trauma patient, because trauma is the number one cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's important to know which came first, the mm. trauma or the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if there isn't a good story, if there's subarachnoid hemorrhage in a typical pattern and there isn't a good story for how the accident occurred, let's say a car accident, it is theoretically possible that an aneurysm ruptured and then the accident occurred. And those are the kind of patients which, who can occasionally be thought to be just trauma patients Exactly. and the aneurysm is, never, is not diagnosed until it rebleeds. Or you have a trauma patient, you're calling up from the ER and you're saying, I have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, bring in the neurosurgery team and they have everything out there ready for the aneurysm but they're, it's, and they're doing the MRI, uh, MRA, but it's actually a trauma. Right, So right. in both cases. Distinguishing those two is very important, two. right. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about the actual treatments. Um, craniotomy, obviously, clipping, endovascular treatments. Tell us a little bit about the state of the art now, what your team does, and what's in the future. Well, the good news is there's been tr traumatic advances uh, and if we had longer, I'd go through the whole history in the last 200 years, but the last 20 years have been very exciting. On the surgical side, advances in microscopes are occurring at a rapid pace. Neuroanesthesia is advanced, making craniotomy safer. Mm -hmm. Techniques for bypass for some complex aneurysms are advancing, and we have t fantastic ways of doing that now. On the endovascular side, there have been amazing advances in, in devices that um, were once just science fiction. Uh, we can now navigate tiny devices into brain vessels and close off aneurysms very safely just working from about, you know, working just while watching a camera. And um, probably the biggest advance in the last two or three years has been the advent of the special stents that can be used to bridge neck, the neck of an aneurysm in the brain. Mm. And that has allowed us to treat more aneurysms safely and aneurysms that may have not been treatable before can now be occasionally be treated with these newer devices. So is endovascular treatment evolving from coiling to stenting? Well, I think uh, in, or a combination? in 2007 it's still a combination, although I think in the future we may have for certain aneurysms stents that can treat an aneurysm without coils. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right now I think the, the, the field is headed in a direction where we have a better understanding of the mechanics of what it takes to close an aneurysm. There's also another parallel line of research looking at the biology of aneurysms and how we can modulate that to influence behavior of the aneurysm. And I think those two areas are going to eventually converge so that we uh, are able to uh, treat most aneurysms with very low risk. So here's an interesting question. Uh, there are interesting parallels between coronary artery disease and cerebral aneurysm disease. We have bypass surgery, open sternotomy, and obviously the end of uh, uh, interventional cardiology approaches and the same in cerebral aneurysm disease. So you had the same problem, clipping is definitive, coiling has a certain recurrence rate for cerebral aneurysm disease. Same for angioplasty and coronary bypass. Coronary bypass is the gold standard. The drug eluting stents uh, extend the, the usefulness, if you will. Is there a parallel in cerebral aneurysm disease? Are there drug eluting stents or drug eluting coils and so forth? Interestingly, we haven't gone the route of the drug elution in the brain, although there have been some preliminary work done in that is direction. That toxicity issues or? Well, I think it's just that, uh, you know, the word is still out on the issues of actually even in the heart. Biology, yeah. yeah the right. biology. And for aneurysms, we don't see the same issues with instant stenosis as we do with uh, atherosclerotic disease. Although there are some rare cases, reported cases of instant stenosis, with, even what with aneurysms. What I was referring more is not so much drugs for restenosis, but drugs that, like you alluded to, that influence the natural history of the disease right, to right. convert a mechanical well, what's, process. What's very interesting now with nanotechnology, yes, exactly. There are now some startup companies and uh, ideas that have come across my desk, where you can actually put drug eluting devices on stents facing the aneurysm, but not facing the parent vessel.
Yes. And so I think that in the next 20 years, that's going to be a hot area. And, um, and so I think that it, it will be part of the future. The question is just when and how. Right. Uh, my last question is, uh, in terms of that balance, we see this often, uh, and this is almost like a, a medical sociology issue, you have the craniotomies by the neurosurgeons and the endovascular treatments by the interventional radiologists, interventional neuroradiologists. Your career, your training spans both. And that's an issue, the turf issues, the right. teamwork issues. How is that evolving? Right, well, what's interesting, I, I trained in both, in microsurgery and endovascular techniques to avoid the turf issue, at least for patients who see me. So for me, I look at it as I have more tools on my shelf, and you yes. know, uh, Do you and think that combined training is going to be more of the future. It is more common now, and there's, uh, and I think it's a healthy approach, and I think that radiologists are working closely with neurosurgeons to, uh, so I think turf issues are becoming less common. Well, indeed, uh, Dr. Bernard Bendock, who personally does not have that turf issue because he covers both, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Uh, neurosurgeon at Northwestern as well as neuroradiologist. I'm Dr. Ogan Gurel with Insights in Medicine. We have a great program next week with urology, Stuart Lipson, and iMed Exchange. See you then.